this slide shows that learning indeed rules across the brain. Uh, actually, is just a way of understanding how different areas of the brain can be understood in terms of the kinds of learning mechanisms that they use. And this is a very high level summary, obviously, but it gives us a good sense of why we might have uh, specialization, not just according to content area in the brain, but also in terms of the kinds of signals that drive learning. And so here we see that the basal ganglia is particularly important for reward-based learning, uh, driven very much by the phasic changes, in, you know, rapid changes in the level of dopamine that everybody's heard of these days. Um, really, the basal ganglia is the primary consumer of dopamine in the brain. It has the most dopamine receptors by far, the densest, and it's really very sensitive to these very transient changes. And so uh, when you get those changes in, in dopamine levels, that actually drives learning in the basal ganglia in response. And everything that you've heard about perhaps in the field of behaviorism, the 19 hundreds to 1950s school of psychology that really emphasized conditioning, classical conditioning, instrumental conditioning, uh, in particular Thorndike's law of effect is a famous rule that says if you do something and you get a positive reward, then you should do more of that. Uh, if you do something and you get a negative outcome, a punishment, you should do less of that. That, that really intuitive basic idea is, is directly implemented through the effects of dopamine in the basal ganglia. And we'll see how that works in chapter seven. Um, and so organisms that of any sort that need to kind of survive in the world really have to have some kind of system that enables them to learn when there's food, that they should continue to approach those areas that have food. And if there's predators or other negative experiences, um, risky situations, painful situations, uh, any kind of thing that leads to a, a negative outcome, um, that those should be avoided, that is just a very fundamental, important kind of adaptive sort of learning. And so these kind of brain systems, the basal ganglia, um, is present very early on in, in brains and reptiles um, and is uh, actually quite a bit larger in humans, but um, is something that the overall structure is fairly well preserved across evolution. So we think of this as kind of a primitive form of learning. It's really basic, uh, early evolving, and very important. Um, and the complementary brain system here, the cerebellum, learns not from these kind of reward signals. In fact, it has almost no dopamine receptors that we know of. Um, it instead is very driven by error signals. And we talked about this in the learning chapter that um, the cerebellum can be uh, thought of as a kind of forward model, a predictor of what's going to happen next and learning to correct those mistakes. That's the kind of error signals we're talking about. And these are very different than reward. Reward is about large scale behavioral outcomes. Did you get something that you wanted? Whereas the cerebellum is really interested in like, how am I actually performing this particular motor action? Is this the smoothest, most efficient way to do this motor action? Or am I kind of being you know, jerky and not smooth? And am I saying things right? Am I pronouncing words correctly? Um, do I have the right pronunciation? Um, all that stuff that we're doing with our mouths and our hands, that's all refined and improved by the cerebellum. So it makes us a much more effective uh, actor in the world and also therefore is a very uh, basic primitive form of learning that is present in uh, most reptiles again and going back to earlier evolutionary uh, uh, points on the tree um, and uh, so that's this kind of complementary form of learning so both of these are areas that are learning about motor control people sort of lump them together and say oh this is these are two motor control areas but in fact they're really different and they're they're learning from very different signals so uh, this is kind of the the learning story about how these systems operate there's also a dynamic story and this is a little bit kind of a, a loose term here but we're kind of saying how, what how does it form the representations that are learned in the system are there are there kind of biases for how this how the information is encoded in these different brain areas 
And here, the cerebellum is really the most extreme example of a pattern separator kind of dynamic. So uh, there's structures there in the um, granule cells of the cerebellum that cause very different patterns of neural activity to be used to encode different motor configurations, sensory input configurations. And essentially, it's working computationally like a lookup table. It's essentially memorizing different uh, kind of corrections that you need to do for when your arm's in this position versus in this position versus in this position. Each of those can be associated with a different kind of correction signal because you're using different neurons to encode that information. And that's this fundamental idea about this kind of pattern separation. And we think it's why there are like half the neurons in the brain because it's using this kind of separator uh, approach. The basal ganglia also uses somewhat of a separator approach, but perhaps not as extreme. Okay, on this part of the uh, table, we have the two more advanced brain systems. Uh, these appeared later in evolution um, and uh, somewhat in reptiles and then very much advanced in, in mammals. Um, the hippocampus doesn't really, isn't strongly modulated by either reward or error signals. It has some influence. Almost every brain area has at least some, except for the cerebellum, interestingly, has some level of dopamine receptors. But we think of it as mostly like a self-organizing system. It's something that is kind of learning on its own automatically, taking snapshots of things that just happened and encoding those, forming these memories sort of automatically. And that's what we mean by self-organizing. And it also, like the cerebellum, employs a strategy of pattern separation. This is the critical insight that David Marr came up with in two back-to-back -back papers in the late 60s, early 70s, showing that these kind of brain systems seem to have this pattern separation kind of approach to, to learning. Those ideas have stood the test of time. But one thing that we start to see here in the uh, hippocampus is also the presence of these kind of attractor dynamics. These are recurrent connections that exist, particularly in one area of the hippocampus that enable it to um, kind of fill in missing pieces of a memory. And uh, that, that is a kind of new innovation that shows up here in the hippocampus. And then it really gets picked up and adapted and, and, and kind of uh, becomes, I think, the dominant feature of the neocortex, um, which is essentially a kind of jack of all trades. It learns by all these different kind of mechanisms. As again, we talked in chapter four a lot about how it does error-driven learning, maybe predominantly. Um, also has elements of self-organizing learning, also influenced likely by reward signals through dopamine and, and other neuromodulators. But instead of being a kind of separator kind of brain system, it, it is uniquely positioned to do kind of integration across different experiences. And this is really the big innovation that emerges here with the neocortex, that you have this ability to form categories, to actually integrate across many different experiences and come up with a prototype, a, a central idea about uh, something like, you know, the chair example that we talked a lot about in the uh, networks chapter. That ability to form those kind of abstract categories really seems to be unique to the neocortex. And so we can really see, given that those categories are so important for how human cognition works, uh, that, that we do have these kind of dividing lines here uh, and these special features of the brain that really are, you know, most exemplified in, in the human brain um, of this ability to form these abstract categories and then to use these kind of attractor dynamics, bi-directional, top-down, bottom-up, filling in all the missing pieces and kind of resonating activity across different areas in the brain. These things seem to be the most important, unique features of the neocortex. And again, interestingly, these attractor dynamics are not really present in the current uh, versions of most uh, artificial intelligence models. So they're kind of missing out on a lot of this uh, features that we think are really important for the neocortex. So this gives us a nice sort of understanding about those kind of gross anatomy divisions in terms of different specializations for these learning principles and how uh, the representations are shaped through the intrinsic dynamics of these networks.